The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. I'd like to begin with my thanks for the, to the organizers for inviting me to uh, this uh, uh, nice event. Uh, and the title I gave for my talk was uh, Towards a Sustainable Bio-Based Economy. But then I, as I was thinking about the material that I was going to present to you, I thought it would be very appropriate to also add uh, that uh, we are in a, an era of uh, 50 to $60 per barrel oil. Uh, and therefore, my remarks would be colored by the fact that uh, this is a low oil era. And therefore, many of you may be wondering how a bio-based economy can fare in such an environment. Uh, first of all, by bio-based economy, I really mean an economy in which fuels and chemicals are derived from renewable resources. And in that way, they contribute towards a sustainable bioeconomy in which the input from fossil fuels is as little as possible. Now, the drivers for this kind of a vision, uh, people are talking about many kind, types of drivers, such as uh, uh, depleted resources, uh, increase in price of oil, which of course is not the case, uh, creating strategic re uh, reserves. Uh, but I think the real driver is uh, uh, <coughs> the push for sustainability and climate uh, change. Uh, this can be actually a whole new topic, but when you look at uh, uh, headlines of this type following the uh, hurricane uh, um, uh, Sandy in the United States, then it is uh, very easy to understand that uh, these are really important uh, forces and we need to deal with them in a technological way. Now, in addition to that, uh, there is also a great push. I mean, these processes can contribute significantly in the... Uh, in creating rural opportunities. I'm not going to talk about this at all. Instead, I would like to focus on the technology push, mainly the technological advances, which uh, create the uh, prerequisites for materializing the vision of the bio-based technology. So I'll just use two or three slides to explain to you uh, what is really the background technology which is fueling these developments. And here we are talking about metabolic engineering, which is uh, creating new chemistry for the production of many of the chemicals and other compounds that we use today in our everyday life. Uh, here we are looking at biology going beyond medicine and biotechnology now, uh, which is going to be the driving force for the production of uh, products that go beyond biofuels. What you see in this diagram is uh, a schematic of how this technology works. When you are looking at uh, this complicated system here, I'm depicting uh, many of the thousands uh, of chemical reactions which take place inside the microbial cell, uh, together with many of the thousands of individual compounds which participate in these reactions. Every little dot that you see here represents a different molecule, and every line connecting these molecules represents a reaction which interconverts the one molecule into another. And this is the kind of a situation which exists in every microbial cell, in every cell, as a matter of fact, including the cells of your body and mine. So what metabolic engineering da does in principle is that uh, it uh, hijacks this incredible network of chemical reactions, and then uh, it uh, directs the input, which is going to be, let's say, sugar or, or glycerol, or some other kind of uh, uh, organic molecule through a specific pathway through this network of reactions into the production of a target product. Uh, the feedstock, the substrate for that uh, can be organic molecules like uh, uh, organic acids, uh, 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 sugars, uh, glycerol, but the kind of products that you can make by uh, putting together a lot of different pathways of reactions is virtually infinite, especially if you consider that you are not dealing only with the reactions which are intrinsic to a particular microbe, but reactions that can be imported into this microbe from a lot of other species of the animal and plant uh, kingdoms, then there is virtually infinite opportunity for creating different types of chemistries for the production of uh, different types of products. So this is the essence of metabolic engineering. And the way we envision that this is going to materialize in real processes is uh, that uh, we are going to stitch to together a series of reactions. So if this is a bacterium cell, 
it is going to take a substrate, and then after the substrate is converted by a series of six reactions, the net result is going to be the production of pentanol, a molecule that this bacterium never produced in its uh, <coughs> life before. Uh, and if you think now, if you extend this paradigm, we are looking at a model in which uh, the processes and the plants that you see here on the left, which is the typical uh, a prototype of a chemical uh, process, is going to be replaced by bacteria of this type, which are going to implement the production of the new molecules and uh, chemicals. Now, uh, <coughs> this is what we envision as uh, the engine of the bio-based economy. But the real question is, uh, um, does this really make sense? Uh, does it make sense from an economical point of view to propose that biotechnology and renewable feedstocks are going to replace many of the existing processes in the chemical uh, industry? And uh, does it make sense to be thinking about this and to propose this kind of a process in a period of time when the basic feedstock of chemical processes, namely uh, natural gas, oil, and naphtha, uh, are so uh, uh, in inexpensive? So let's take a look to see what's happening in this uh, space, and let's do a reality check. Uh, what is the current state of affairs in commercial applications of industrial biotechnology, and exactly what's happening in this uh, space? When we do that, what we see is that there is a total disaster. Things are not really doing well in industrial biotechnology, and here I have a list of uh, a number of uh, companies which uh, either uh, bankrupted or they were bought by another company, or they were downsized significantly, or their stock is doing very, very poorly. So in general, this is not a pretty picture when you are surveying the field of industrial biotechnology. On the other hand, if you look at biotechnology in general, this is not bad at all. What I have here is the uh, business of biotechnology in 2010, in 2015, this was actually the projected figures by this source here for 2015, and they're pretty close to this number because now it is 2015. So biotechnology, including industrial biotechnology, are doing well. However, we have uh, the whole landscape littered by many failures of startup companies and existing and, and established companies uh, uh, at, uh, alike. So what exactly is going on here? Let me show you another list. This is a list of uh, companies. Uh, the first uh, five up to here, first four, they deal primarily with bioethanol plants of second generation. So you have Biochemtex in Italy, DSM Poet, DuPont, Aben Goa in the United States, Grand Bio in Brazil. So all of these companies have put together about uh, seven or eight second generation cellulosic ethanol plants. At the same time, you have uh, uh, companies like Genomatica, Myriant, Novogy, Solazyme, and various others targeting different types of molecules, different types of products, uh, which are the bread and butter of the chemical processing industry. So on one hand, you have a lot of failures, but at the same time, you have a strong and increasing interest in this area of metabolic engineering and industrial biotechnology. So it is really important to ask what is happening and how these events are really affected by the price of oil and by whatever other factors are taking place in the environment, in the, the business environment of today. I think that what we see here is, uh, um, is a, a, a demonstration of the fact that bio-based chemicals and biofuels are first and foremost a feedstock story. And I'm going to give you some numbers so you can appreciate exactly what's going on here and how this leads into the picture that I showed you before. So if you have a glucose at $400 per ton, which corresponds to $6.70 per bushel of corn, then the feedstock cost of ethanol alone is $800 per ton, and this translates into $350 per gallon of gasoline equivalent. Clearly, we don't have this number here, and we don't have this number for corn. We have much lower numbers. Corn now is between $380 and $450 per bushel in the United States. And if you have these prices for corn, then the prices for gasoline, uh, for ethanol, 
are going to be between 2 and 240, let's say, per gallon of gasoline equivalent. So extreme sensitivity of the prices of this commodity fuel to the price of uh, the feedstock, which in this particular case is corn. So let's take a look at the prices of uh, corn and petroleum over the last, uh, uh, what's that, 30 years. And what you see in this graph here is that they very closely track one another. So here we have the price of corn going down to 450 per bushel. At that time, in the graph that I am showing here, the price of oil was more than 100, but you know that this number now is down to this level. So clearly, oil and the corn, they track very closely one another. Now, uh, how about biomass? <coughs> biomass is another source of uh, uh, feedstock, and it can be used for the production of chemicals and fuels. So if you have biomass at $50 per dry ton, uh, and then you assume that 70% of it is cellulose and hemicellulose, and you have 70% saccharification uh, yield, then this comes down to about 10 cents per pound for the cost of the simple sugars which are produced from this biomass, which is a good number if you can pay $50 per dry ton of biomass. So I did uh, the following simple calculation last night, and I collected all of these results in this slide, because a very simple question is, if I have a barrel of oil for which I'm paying today 50 or $60, what does that number mean in terms of the cost of gasoline or diesel that you pay at the pump in the United States? And if I have a ton of biomass, and then if I deconstruct this biomass and make sugars out of that, and use these sugars to make ethanol or diesel or other fuels, what's the cost of that final product as a function of how much money I pay per ton of biomass? So the results in a very simple calculation are here. If you assume, if you assume that you have $20 per barrel processing cost in the refining uh, process, and 80% of the crude oil are refined products, then this is what you get if the price of oil is 30, 60, and $100 per barrel. You have these numbers here. And you need to contrast now these numbers here with the prices or the, with the cost of uh, fuels derived from biomass if you pay 25, 50, or $100 per ton of biomass. And then if you assume that you have 50% yield per ton of biomass for the sugars, 10 cents per kilogram of enzymes for the uh, uh, hydrolysis of uh, uh, cellulosic and hemicellulosic sugars, and you have 50% ethanol yield for per sugar, and 30% of feedstock cost for the processing of all of this. And what you see, you get these numbers here. So when you look at this picture, uh, and you are reflecting on that, we are here today, in the United States, it is between 50 and $100 for the cost of biomass. So you're, you're looking at uh, a cost per gasoline of gallon per gasoline equivalent, something which is in the range of what you get from oil. And the real important question is, where do you see these trends going? Do you see oil going to this level here? I mean, you have to ask the question of uh, what is the bottom uh, uh, line price that an oil company uh, 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 is willing to accept, uh, which reflects really the cost of uh, deriving that oil. Uh, 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 extracting oil in, um, in the Atlantic by Petrobras, I read yesterday, is between 50 and $60 per barrel. Uh, the cost is going to be different in the Arctic. You, people say that the cost in Saudi Arabia is uh, 3 to $5 per barrel. But you really have to ask the question, what is the cost not for getting a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia, but what is the cost of running Saudi Arabia as a country, and that is much bigger than the $5 it costs to derive that oil. So I don't think we are going to see prices of oil in this range here, but on the other hand, it is very instructive to ask the question, are we likely to see prices of biomass trending in this direction here instead of the other way around? And from what I'm hearing here in Brazil, the trend is towards reducing the cost of biomass from 50 towards 25 and 30, therefore going in this direction here, while oil is likely to go in the opposite direction for a number of reasons that I mentioned. So these are the factors that really affect the realization of the bio-based economy. 
And uh, um, just a few words about the cost of biomass. That's been determined in a number of different ways uh, by economists looking at uh, the minimum uh, cost that uh, a farmer is willing to accept and also at the maximum cost a processor is willing to pay. You can account for all of these different uh, uh, costs and that kind of a calculation is going to give you for the United States a cost between 80 and $110 per ton of biomass. Uh, you can look at some of the calculations done by the Department of Energy and you see that uh, the cost per dry ton is going to trend in this direction until it reaches an inflection point as a function of the volume. So we are looking at uh, 60 to $65 per dry ton of biomass. And uh, if you have corn stover, the cost may be lower, but the numbers are much smaller because there is not enough corn stover in the United States for this production. So cost of biomass in the United States, 50 to $100. Cost of biomass in other parts of the world, um, projected biomass cost in Brazil in 25 to $30 per ton. Uh, you can look at biomass waste in Europe in particular. You are looking at 20 to 25 euros per ton. So the projected prices for feedstock, which is going to fuel this bio-based economy, trends in a positive direction as far as renewables are concerned. And I think that in the long run, the competition with oil is going to be in favor of the biotechnological products. Um, so let me also say a few words about chemicals. Um, and what is the situation for the case of uh, chemicals? If you are paying glucose at $400 per ton, then if you are making lipids from this glucose and you have a yield of 25%, then you have a feedstock cost only of $1,600 per ton versus about $1,000, which is the present selling, selling price. So making lipids is not going to be very successful if you have to pay this kind of money for the cost of uh, glucose. But on the other hand, if you look at other products, for example, monoethylene glycol, and you have a yield of 0.5 grams per gram of uh, glucose, then this would give you a feedstock cost of $800 per ton versus $1,200, which is the selling price. And if you are not paying 400, but you are paying something like 250, which is the current price, then you have a very clear advantage over the present process, which is based on fossil fuels. So you can do this kind of calculation for a number of chemicals, and you are going to come up with this type of a picture. What I'm showing here is the price of the product, and what I'm showing here is the cost of raw material uh, in terms of dollars per kilogram. And uh, the size of each one of these bubbles here represents the size of the market for the corresponding product. And you will see that uh, the feedstock cost divides this into a region here where you do have the opportunity to make these products biotechnologically, and you are going to be at a cost advantageous compared to the price at which they are selling today. If you add actually something like a 40% processing cost to this feedstock cost, you are going to have the green line, and the green line leaves a big space of the present uh, volume of chemicals production uh, open to the possibility of being manufactured by biotechnological processes. So this is a very encouraging message because it is saying that uh, you are looking at products like methanol, terephthalic acid, monoethylene uh, glycol, butane diol, adipic acid. These are large commodity chemicals which are part of our everyday life because they are used in the manufacturing of uh, diapers, bottles like this, uh, um, many different types of uh, polymers like spandex, for example. And uh, they, this, this table shows that uh, it is possible to make many of them by using renewable feedstocks if you have uh, a technology which is going to allow you to do that. So um, you can do the same thing using syn gas as a feedstock. So the picture is uh, pretty much similar to the one I showed you before. And uh, uh, the conclusion that one can draw from this is that uh, there are many opportunities for new innovative processes based on biotechnology for the production of chemicals and fuels. 
And uh, uh, the real issue here is uh, not really the price of oil. The price of oil is going to be going up and down, and this is going to be tracked by the price of corn in the United States. So neither one of the two processes is going to have an advantage all over the other because of the feedstock cost. The real competition is going to be decided by which one of the two types of processes is really more cost efficient. Is it chemistry or is it biotechnology? Now, I was giving this kind of talk uh, to another audience and uh, uh, a gentleman from a company making catalysts rose up and said, uh, how can you suggest that biotechnology can be competitive with chemistry when the space time or the productivity of a catalytic process is a thousand times greater than the productivity of a biological process? And he is right. The, uh, the biological processes in general are slow. They are not as fast as chemical processes simply because we raise the temperature in chemical processes and we make them very fast. So it is very important to address this question head on and ask uh, what are the advantages of one process over another and how they are going to compete at the end of the day in defining which of the two processes is really more important. So we have a tug of war between chemistry and biotechnology. And we have some kind of a creative distraction here in which I'm suggesting that uh, we are going to replace low-cost depreciated plants, which are used today to make many of these commodity chemicals, by new, more efficient plants based on biotechnology that utilize renewable resources. And someone again may say that why is this going to happen? What really is going on here? and how these forces are going to define which one of the two is more competitive. So uh, let me begin by pointing out the selectivity of bioprocesses. Uh, the productivity is one thing, but the selectivity is a far more important consideration. And here we have the comparison between biochemical processes and catalytic or thermochemical processes. What you see in this diagram is a schematic of a flow sheet for the production of alcohols utilizing a Fischer-Tropsch process. Don't pay attention to the details of this diagram. What is really important to notice here is that uh, this is a very complex uh, process flow sheet. It has many units, it has many recycles, and this kind of a plant cannot be designed to make a single product only. So the cost of a plant like this is going to be in the range of billions of dollars. On the other hand, if you look at a, pro, uh, at a plant that makes ethanol, let's say, either first or second generation, what you have is a very simple linear uh, process involving two or three units with no recycles, and it makes only one product, which is ethanol. If you are looking at the process making succinic acid, it looks like this. If you are looking at the process making uh, propane diol, it looks like this. So a biochemical plant is going to be smaller, is going to cost a lot less money of the order of uh, uh, 50 to 150 million dollars versus two to five billion dollars, and it is going to make a single product. So if you want to make a single product, you are not going to select a petrochemical process which will make a dozen other products as well and therefore you need to address a dozen different markets. You just select the process which is going to deliver that particular product for you. Also, if you recall, the feedstock cost plays a very important role in the final cost of the product. The feedstock contributes anywhere from 65 to 80% of the total product cost. Therefore, the feedstock cost and the selectivity are the more important characteristics in deciding the competitiveness of the process, not really the productivity. The productivity is the size of the plant, but the size and the capital cost contributes about 15% of the total cost of the product. Therefore, on that account alone, biochemical processes do have a significant advantage over the thermochemical processes. So these processes are simple. They make a single product. They, they have low capex. And uh, as I said before, because the product cost is dominated by the feedstock cost, uh, what we have here because of the high selectivity is an advantage over the catalytic and thermochemical processes. Uh, many of these processes uh, work in water. 
and many catalysts do not work very well in water, so that's another advantage. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they are very well tuned to utilize sugar substrates, so if you're thinking about a uh, process which is going to be a based on renewable resources, mainly sugars, biotechnology is much better prepared to deal with these substrates than chemistry. Uh, catalysts are very sensitive and microbes are a lot more robust than catalysts, so this is another consideration. And finally, we don't have uh, the harsh conditions of high temperatures and pressures when we are looking at the biochemical process. These are a significant list of reasons that contribute to making a biochemical process really competitive compared to the current trend which is based on chemistry instead of biotechnology. So uh, what I've tried to do uh, in these 25 minutes is to uh, explain to you or rather to describe to you the vision of a bio-based economy, uh, namely an economy in which renewable feedstocks play a very important role and they are used only for, not only for the production of uh, uh, specialty chemicals and pharmaceuticals, but for the production of many of the commodity chemicals that we use in our society today. And I've tried also to uh, provide support for my argument that uh, the efficiency of these processes does not really depend on how much the price of oil per barrel is going to be. If the price of oil is high, so it's going to be the price of corn. And if you pay less for oil as a feedstock for a fossil fuel based process, you are also going to pay less for corn as the feedstock for a bio-based process. Uh, I also try to explain to you that the trends in general for fossil fuels and oil, despite what we read in the newspapers, is upwards while the trends for biomass is downwards because of uh, innovation and continuous development of these technologies. Keep in mind that, uh, yes, the United States is producing now about 12 million barrels per oil of oil per year, but uh, much of it comes from relatively high cost operations like the shale oil in North Dakota. The produ production cost of that oil is not going to drop down to 30 and 40 dollars per barrel. It is more likely going to be between 60 and 70, and that really puts uh, a bottom on how low you expect the oil to be without suffering major ba bankruptcies of these operations. And then I try to present to you the arguments of why biotechnological processes uh, have significant advantages when it comes to be compared with the existing chemical processes. This is a very a cardinal point of my presentation because at the end of the day, you are gonna have to deal with the introduction of a new mind frame and a new process. And for the last uh, 80 to 100 years, the world has advanced to a point at which we are dominated by a chemical industry. And I'm saying that this chemical industry is not going to fare well in comparison with many emerging biotechnological industries especially when you begin to include characteristics such as a carbon tax or the carbon uh, uh, footprint of a particular process and concerns about sustainability and uh, renewable feedstocks. Uh, I'm going to close my talk with uh, a number of examples that will illustrate uh, the types of molecules that uh, uh, can be made by these processes. Uh, and uh, also will illustrate the fact that these are not pi pipe dreams, but these are real processes which can be implemented with a little further development uh, in many of the areas that I'm talking about in the very near future. Uh, these applications come primarily from my laboratory, but there are many others of the same type which are being under development in many other laboratories around the world. So we are not talking about three or four specific examples here. We are talking perhaps about dozens of examples. And I can tell you something else, that uh, if you could look at the inner workings of the research laboratories of major chemical and, uh, chemical and oil companies, you would find a very strong emphasis on biotechnological processes that utilize renewable resources. So this is not only something which is going on in academic laboratories. This is actually a very high priority for many of the existing chemical and fuel companies. So, 
Uh, the first example is about the production of ethylene glycol. Uh, ethylene glycol is a product which has a market today of about uh, 20 to 25 million tons. Uh, it's a huge market. It's used in a number of different applications as an anti-freeze in uh, the frozen uh, northeast of the United States, but also as resin for the production of polymers and as one of the monomers which are used for the production of a polymer bottle like this. So uh, you can make ethylene glycol by utilizing five carbon sugars like xylose, for example, and the pathway for doing that is to break this sugar into an intermediate, which is a two-carbon intermediate and a, thri a three-carbon intermediate. And then you design a pathway by which the C2 intermediate is converted into ethylene glycol, and the C3 intermediate is converted into ethylene glycol and CO2. And we have engineered the pathway like this, and uh, uh, this gives us uh, production of ethylene glycol in excess of uh, 40 grams per liter at uh, pretty interesting yields which uh, are not quite close to the theoretical maximum, but they can be further engineered to reach the, 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 the theoretical, close to the theoretical maximum. And uh, this is a proven pathway which works from sugar and it is available today. It is industrially relevant and uh, um, it can be uh, 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 implemented in a short period of time. Uh, another product which comes from the same pathway is glycolic acid. Uh, glycolic acid is a much smaller market. It is something like 50,000 tons per year. It is used in many formulations for creams and cosmetics because it increases the penetration of different molecules through the skin. So many of the cosmetic uh, uh, powders and creams that people use, they contain glycolic acid. Uh, the price is much higher, more than $2 per kilo, $2,000 per ton. And again, it can be synthesized by engineering the pathway in E. coli to make a significant amount of uh, glycolic acid at yields which now approach 0.7 grams per gram, and they are much closer to the theoretical maximum. And if you look at the accumulation of glycolic acid, this is also coming close to 42 grams per liter at uh, very good productivities and very good yields. So here you have another product which can be very competitive, and it is just as an example of what can be done with this technology. Let me give you a third example, uh, which is about the synthesis of lipids for biodiesel production using carbohydrates. So uh, uh, biodiesel is uh, uh, usually made from uh, cooked oils, uh, wasted oils, because they have a very low price, uh, and then the conversion process of these cooked oils or discarded oils into biodiesel is a very simple chemical transesterification process. The problem with this process is that there is very low availability of this feedstock of discarded oils, so we need to find another, kind, an, another source for the production of these lipids. So the idea is to convert carbohydrates, sugars, uh, five carbon uh, sugars, six carbon sugars into lipids and then use these lipids in order to make biodiesel out of that. Uh, we have worked on this in this area for quite a long time. Uh, this is the pathway that uh, leads to the synthesis of lipids in an oleogenous yeast such as Yarovia lipolytica. And we have engineered this pathway by overexpressing two genes one of which is pushing the flux into the pathway that makes lipids, and the other is pull it, pulling this lipid out of the pathway and sequesters that into lipid bodies that accumulate inside the microbe. And uh, in combination, actually, with a third one, which is important in the accumulation of lipids in the adipose tissue, we were able to engineer a microbe that leads to the accumulation of 60 grams per liter of lipids. This is the lipid accumulation curve. And the lipid content is of the order of 66% and higher. You see a, a yield of 0.25 grams per gram, which is really very high, and the productivity in the range of 0.7 and higher of grams of per, per, li per, per liter per hour. Uh, so these are figures which can justify the design of a process 
to produce lipids from carbohydrates. Uh, if you look at uh, the microbes, um, this is actually not a good picture here because the colors are very distorted. This is a better one. Uh, and you see that uh, you have microbes which are full of lipids. The bright side here is the stained lipid, and it shows you that uh, almost all of the volume of the cell is occupied by these lipids as you are looking at the lipid content of these microbes. Now, um, in uh, looking at these processes, as I said before, the cost of the feedstock is a very important factor in the overall economics. So it is important to always be looking at alternative feedstocks, and in particular, cheap feedstocks. Glucose is going to be expensive, is going to be competing with food, so it is important to look at other potential feedstocks, and one of them is acetic acid and volatile fatty acids. And you can get the acetic acid from anaerobic digestion, so you can have trash here, garbage, the cheapest feedstock you can imagine, you can do an anaerobic digestion of trash, and you have a trash to fuels process by which you convert garbage into volatile fatty acids, and then you convert the volatile fatty acids into lipids by doing a Yarovia fermentation. On the other hand, you can look at gases, and these gases can be syngas that you pay money for, or it can be the waste effluent coming out of a steel mill in which you have CO and CO2, which are simply flared, and they are used only for their heating value. So if you can take the CO in the exhaust gases of a steel mill, then you can do a gas to liquid anaerobic fermentation, also to produce volatile fatty acids, and then from this BFAs, you can ferment that by aerobia in order to make lipids and biodiesel from that. And we've done all of these processes. Let me just show you that if you have a gas to liquid process, then you can use an anaerobic microbe such as Murilla thermoacidica that converts CO and hydrogen, fixing CO2 for the production of acetate. And uh, we are talking about producing 30 grams per liter of acetate, which is a pretty respectable level of acetic acid. And then you can use that acetic acid in a second stage process, which is going to convert this acetic acid into lipids. And we have accumulation of lipids in the range of 50 to 60 grams per liter at a yield that makes this overall process to be a very attractive process. So especially for the case of fermenting exhaust gases from steel mills, in which you are fixing CO2 using the CO, which is also present in these gases, then you can have a very cost-efficient process because you pay very little money for the cost of the feedstock. This particular process now is being implemented at the pilot plant scale in China, and uh, it has a very good potential for producing large amounts of biodiesel, utilizing the exhaust gases of steel mills in many parts of the world. So, um, yeah, this is just uh, to uh, indicate that we have uh, lipid titers by this overall process in the range of 60 grams per liter and lipid content of 75%. Productivities and uh, yields are very respectable. And uh, this is uh, a picture of the integrated system that includes a bubble column in which we grow anaerobically the CO2 fixing bacteria. The, the acetic acid which is produced from here is fed into the aerobic oleogenous yeast. And then at the end of the day, we have the production of lipids, which can be used for the production of uh, uh, biodiesel. So in this overall process, the input is gases, and the output is uh, lipids in the form of accumulated lipids in the oleogenous microbe that we use. So with this, I see that my time is uh, almost uh, over. Uh, I'm going to close by acknowledging the group of uh, people, postdocs, and students who have contributed in the four examples that uh, I showed you before. And uh, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And uh, I believe we are going to have a little time for uh, uh, questions. I'll be happy to, to answer any of them. Thank you.